TLO, what's poppin'? We are on kick, K I C K dot com. We are not live though, man, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, right here above us, that's just in case we go live and you happen to miss it. This is where all the highlights and, and shorts and things of that nature will be. Um, it's the lit one live. Um, don't forget, we also got merch. You feel me? Merch. And we also got the the uh, Patreon. Just uploaded Sherlock. This is, I owe this from Friday. Uh, I just finished watching Afterlife, which I'm also going to upload today uh, after I do this video. And uh, yeah, go check it out. See if you want to like anything over there that we're watching. Five days per week we watch. If we miss if we miss a day, we make it up. I do not post on Saturday, Sunday, so get off of it. Um, yeah, and we got a Discord. The link to all of these is down below in the description. It's something called a link tree down there. Click it, man, and, you know, it makes it possible. Salute to Disturbing, man. I be watching some crazy... They got some crazy short documentaries. I like this channel, man. Even though it's disturbing, but, you know... Anyway, uh, a case almost too gruesome to mention, Brian Waters. Okay. I got heartburn. This case takes place in the United Kingdom on the 19th of June, 2003. Andrew Lamb was known as a successful English businessman living a life of wealth and luxury in Malta. But in reality, he was keeping a dark secret. His name was not Andrew Lamb, it was Christopher Guestmore Jr. And he was involved in one of the most brutal and cruel cases in British legal history. Christopher grew up privileged and wealthy. As a teenager, Christopher left school to join the family business, but it was no ordinary business. As part of his duties, Christopher would learn about the world of surveillance and gathering intelligence. And like his father before him, he too became a success in the industry, displaying an aptitude for undercover work and investigation. Okay. Christopher showcased his talents when he infiltrated organized crime gangs in Wolverhampton and a Sherlock Holmes? far-right movement in Nottingham, collaborating with media outlets like Channel 4 and BBC. His future seemed promising and he was well on the way to building a successful career in the television business. However, fate took a dark turn when he crossed paths with one of Manchester's most notorious gangsters, John Wilson. A, a man with an incredibly violent reputation. He drew Christopher into the world of crime, leading him to commit horrific acts. Oh. So Christopher went to promised, fam promised Sherlock detective family business to a good old thug. I'm t I, t I tell people all the time, if your mind is not strong enough or your circle is not strong enough, darkness will overtake any of my, like, I don't know what it is, like, the, str the pool of darkness will, be will win if you're not fortified up here. Also working with Wilson was a man named Brian Waters, a 44-year-old cannabis dealer who was growing plants at Burnt House Farm near Cheshire. He set up the farm at Burnt House with his son and daughter, who were adults, and a man named Solomon Razek. Whilst Brian dealt for Wilson, he kept this operation secret, and the operation made around £3,000 a month. Brian had contacts in the Netherlands, and he would often broker deals between Wilson and his other Dutch associates. In 1999, during a return trip to the UK from Holland, Brian was caught at a port with £20,000 in cash. This cash belonged to John Wilson. The money was of course from dealing illegal substances, and because Brian couldn't give a reason where this money had come from, it was confiscated. Despite this incident, Brian and Wilson's association... That's crazy that you could just confiscate money. Like, if you can't think on a dime, like... I would've, yeah, that's the back end. I just did a show in Holland. I'm a rapper. 
investigation continued, and by late 2002, Brian was involved in dealing other substances on behalf of the mobster. But during the Christmas season, Brian was robbed. This resulted in him owing thousands of more pounds to Wilson, plunging him further into debt. Wilson was furious. He demanded Christopher's skills in surveillance to be used on Brian and his family. He was tasked with trailing Brian's son Gavin from their home and followed him all the way to Burnt House Farm where they were secretly growing the plants. Christopher oh, and Wilson didn't know about this one. waited for Gavin to leave and then entered the farm, coming across the secret operation. Christopher relayed this information back to Wilson, who was absolutely outraged. He believed that Brian was going behind his back and selling without his consent. So, Wilson gave the orders for his gang to ransack Brian's farm, steal his plans and equipment. This gang included Christopher, a man named James Raven, otherwise known as the Milkman, due to him being able to deliver when hired to deal with other criminals. He was also somewhat of an intimidating man, with tattoos that read Maniac and Proceed with Caution, and there was a good reason for these tattoos. There was also Otis Matthews, who was Wilson's right-hand man, and someone who was capable of extreme violence. And finally, David Moran. David would play no part in what was about to unfold. He was there to keep watch for the police whilst the other gang members ransacked the farm, but more on his part later. Wilson got these four men to do his dirty work and sent them over to the farm. Well, when these men free. arrived, nobody else was there. They began loading all of the plants and equipment into a van they had brought with them, stealing everything of value. They drove the loaded van away to another location and returned to the farm to send a message. Soon when Razak arrived at the farm to tend to the plants, completely oblivious to the horrors that awaited him. Little did he know that his life was about to change forever as he was ambushed by the men sent by Wilson. Showing up on the first page of Google might not be the- Bro, <laughs> that's a funny clip. My bad. Bro didn't even know either, he just walked in. Entered the farm, Razak endured a relentless barrage of punches and kicks to his face. The men started demanding for money, but Razak had no idea what they were talking about. The men then tied him up with rope and suspended him upside down and plunged him headfirst into a barrel filled with dirty water. They continued to press Razek for the information about the money, but Razek replied saying that he had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah, after after you hang me upside down and dip me in dirty water a thousand times and I still don't know, like, at some point you gotta be like, okay, he really don't know. At some point you gotta be like, he really don't know. So, the men then electrocuted him and poured acid on his body. The brutality only escalated from there. A pillowcase was thrown over Razek's head and set on fire. The fire burned his shoulders and neck before it was extinguished. He was then tortured with an industrial staple gun, causing unimaginable pain and torment. Multiple staples were fired into his head and back. This horrific torture lasted for well over an hour, but he was still alive. And did the artist the dude in one hour? Then Brian, totally unaware of what was happening, arrived at the farm. Brian was immediately attacked. He suffered the same fate as Razek. He was beaten, tied up, and lowered headfirst into dirty water. Razek watched in horror as Brian was subjected to the same torment, but they took it a step further. One of the men retrieved an iron bar. They inserted this bar into Brian's anus. Ain't no way. I understand, like, like I, I don't condone any of this. This is messed up. Like, it's torture. But to do that to another man, you gotta have some type of zest going on through your body which is fine salute to the community but to do that to another man that didn't still claim that you not zesty at all i don't i, I don't know
The bar was pushed into him with such force that it ruptured his insides. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Brian's children were part of the operations on the farm, and Brian they was had there? to meet them at the farm. So they too turned up. Their names are Natalie and Gavin. Natalie was just about to turn 21, and Gavin was 25. As they approached the farm, the three men apprehended them and brought them to where their father was held. Gavin was horrifically beaten as they demanded Brian to hand over the money. Gavin was then tied up and a noose was placed around his neck. The rope was thrown over a beam and tightened, which resulted in him being choked. Natalie was also tied up and placed next to her father. The gang put a gun in Natalie's mouth and demanded the money from Brian, but he didn't have it. Well, Natalie would later it. say, they turned his chair around to see me and told him to look at your daughter. Do you really want her to go through this? Then one of them sliced off her top with a knife and demanded the 20,000 to be handed over. A bin bag was then set on fire over Brian. The hot plastic dripped onto his exposed skin. The industrial stapler was then fired into his back and skull. Gavin and Natalie could do nothing but watch as their father was mercilessly beaten for hours. After a total of three hours, Brian finally succumbed to his injuries and he passed away. Natalie would later say that she could hear her father breathing heavily, but then his breathing stopped. She knew that her father was dead. The gang, not yet satisfied with their cruelty, then stole Brian's car and made their way over to his home. It was clearly the, uh, the when they put that rod in him, rupturing the inside stuff, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's gonna do it to you. Where his wife was. They theorized that the missing money could be there. So they abducted Brian's wife, Julie, and she was driven to the farm. As I mentioned earlier, the fourth man, David Moran, was keeping lookout. Whilst he was doing this, Wilson told David to call the police and report that he had seen an attack at the farm. Why this happened is unclear. Place. Newport connecting, payphone 01565 7220252. As the men had got to the farm with Julie, the police arrived on the scene, responding to the call made by David. The men ran, but James Raven was caught by the police, as Otis and Christopher were able to get away. As the police descended upon the farm, they were met with disturbing scenes of extreme violence and horror. They found Brian dead, but thankfully Natalie, Gavin and Rosek were all still alive, although they were of course extremely traumatized and in horrific pain. An autopsy was conducted on Brian's body. They found that he had over 100 separate injuries in what was one of the worst torture cases Britain has ever mm. seen. His insides were ruptured by the iron bar, he had broken ribs, bleeding on the brain, fractures to his face, a collapsed lung, and the list just goes on. At the crime scene, the killers left behind a trail of damning clues that seemed almost too absurd to be true. Due to the police arriving unexpectedly, the criminals had failed to clean up after themselves, leaving behind a treasure trove of incriminating items scattered all around the crime scene. Wrappings of food and bottles of drink were found all around. It seemed that the attackers had indulged in a bizarre feast whilst committing these horrific acts. The police also stumbled upon something incredibly strange. 
a plastic bag filled with human feces. As the bag of feces underwent examination, it revealed a critical link to one of the perpetrators, Christopher Guestmore Jr. The presence of his DNA was found in the bag, but that was not all. <laughs> so, there was just... So during all of this time, after eating and smoking and doing this and, and torturing, they boo-booed in a bag and they was going to get rid of it far away to leave no DNA, but because of police... Okay, that makes sense, kind of. As the investigators continued their search, they discovered more damning evidence. Samples taken from a bottle of Sprite and Marlboro Light ends matched Christopher's identity, as did a glove found near the main gate of the farm. The police then found that Christopher had connections with Wilson. Using mobile phone data as evidence, they managed to find who else was responsible for this shocking crime. Otis and Wilson were arrested, along with David Moran, the man who called the police. He told the police that he would be a witness in the trial in exchange for a lesser sentence, and he turned on the rest of the gang. The police did, then went to arrest. Why did they have him call the police though? That don't make sense. Asked Christopher, only to find that he had escaped the country. They found CCTV footage of him in Liverpool John Lennon Airport on his way to Malaga, where he embarked on his life as a fugitive. Christopher's father and mother helped him in the escape. They would later receive nine months for helping him evade justice. Christopher vanished into the shadows, spending the next several years evading justice. His movements during this period from 2003 to 2007 remain shrouded in mystery as he cleverly covered his tracks and evaded capture. John Wilson, James Raven and Otis Matthews were all convicted. These convictions were the result of trials held between 2004 and 2007. All three pleaded not guilty, but there was overwhelming evidence linking all of them to the crime. DNA evidence, witness testimony and phone records. All three were sentenced to life in prison. Wilson and Raven were given a minimum term of 24 years and Otis a minimum term of 22 years. David Moran was sentenced to 21 months for his part in the killing of Brian. David was given a lesser sentence as he helped the police with the case. Because of this, he will remain in witness protection for the rest of his life. Of course. Meanwhile, Christopher moved from country to country. He found refuge in the Mediterranean haven of Malta, where he assumed a new identity. God damn, this is a beautiful place to, you know what I'm saying? Andrew Lamb. In this exotic paradise, he lived a life of luxury. He lived in a grand villa, drove a Porsche, and worked as a luxury yacht captain. To those who knew him in Malta, he was a seemingly successful British businessman with connections that reached as far as the Moroccan royal family and the Egyptian military. As Christopher settled into his new life of luxury, he believed he had successfully escaped justice. He immersed himself in a world of wealth and prestige, relishing in the illusion of safety and freedom. However, the police were gradually closing in on him. For 16 long years, Christopher Guestmore Jr. managed to elude justice, but in Bro was on a run for 16 years, living a great life in Malta? After, after the first three years, you like, okay, got him. You know what I'm saying? But like 16, they were still on him? May of 2019, Christopher's name appeared on Europe's most wanted list. Just four weeks after this listing, Christopher was identified and caught. Throughout the painstaking extradition proceedings that followed, he clung to his new identity of Andrew Lamb, which further complicated the process, but his true identity was soon exposed, and he was brought back to the United Kingdom. March of 2021 marked a pivotal moment as the trial of Christopher commenced at Chester Crown Court. He was charged with murder, but he denied any wrongdoing and proclaimed his innocence. During the trial, Christopher's demeanor seemed composed and polished when he was questioned by his own barrister. But as the prosecution cross-examined him, his facade began to crack. The once brash and arrogant man now appeared to be unsettled, with evident gaps in his account and evasive answers. 
In a rather dramatic twist, Christopher received unexpected support from his godfather, Stephen Hayes. Stephen claimed that he was with Christopher on the night of the murder and yeah, that they went to a wine bar together. This testimony suggested that Christopher could not have been at the scene of the crime, leading the jury to deadlock, resulting in a retrial in November. However, this time, the jurors were not swayed by the new account, as overwhelming evidence was presented over the course of a month. Despite Christopher's protests of innocence, it became very clear that he had been an eager participant in the heinous violence inflicted on behalf of Wilson. After 18 years, Christopher was found guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 24 years. It then came out that Christopher and James Raven were undercover TV researchers who investigated the criminal underworld on behalf of the BBC. They were paid £52,000 by the BBC for just one job, despite them knowing full well that they were part of the criminal underworld. The case of Brian Waters is one of the most horrific in British legal history and has left a lasting, unimaginable pain on his family. Razek, Julie, Man. Gavin and Natalie continue to bear the heavy burden of that fateful day, grappling with emotional scars and regular flashbacks. I would imagine PTSD is going crazy, man. That's wild. Tell leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Leave some comments. Let me know what y'all think. Let's chop it up.